Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre here at the Graduate Centre CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theatre and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theatre artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community it is time I think and we feel to start making sense to ask uh, questions why are we making theater but also how are we producing it and for whom and uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community. So I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome everybody here to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown uh, Manhattan. It is a beautiful day outside. We have the sunshine after a couple of days of rain and the sun is shining, I think, today um, on uh, our honoree uh, for um, uh, our Prelude Festival. Each year we do um, uh, celebrate the work and honor the work as a representative for many, many others, but someone who made a real contribution to the theater community who made a difference and whose engagement we think um, stands for the generosity, the sincerity, and also significance of uh, contributions theater artists do make, not only to their own field, but also um, to the city. And we have with us Shade today, Shade uh, Lithgott, and uh, from the um, National Black Theater up there in Harlem. It's a great, great honor to have you with us. And um, our team decided and voted, you know, that. Um, uh, it is time to recognize the outstanding and significant and also beautiful work um, she is doing. Uh, with us, we have Jonathan uh, um, McCrory, um, also from the theater, from the National Black Theater, and the great Keith uh, Joseph Atkins, Atkins, who we had many times with us um, on the Siegel Talks for New Black Fest. And, and um, normally he is based in the on the West Coast, but he happens to be here this week. It's a great honor to have all of you here. And um, I would like to say welcome. And uh, how are you guys? Sally, how are you? How are you? Jonathan, Keys. Hang in there. It is, <laughs> it is a wonderful time to be alive and to interrogate what it means to be alive. This Thursday feels like the longest Thursday of any week, you know? Um, but it's incredible to be able to just take a pause and be here uh, with you today to celebrate Black theater, celebrate coalitions of theater of color. And then the fact that I get these two genius, genius people with me uh, to have a conversation, Jonathan and Keith, um, it's a good day. How and about y'all? I'm doing... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's a. I have to. I have to say, like, it's been beautiful to have this opportunity to feel. Um, to feel the sunshine. I mean, like we, Shade and I just left. Just left this beautiful conversation. It feels really inspiring, although very like dynamically pulling in so many different ways. It feels like as we reopened. Um, I was actually texting Shade earlier. Earlier, just talking about how it's really weird when you wake up in the morning and you just feel like you don't have enough time. And what does time feel like in this new age of both being on Zoom, but also having to be in person and the friction between the two and how, although we might not have wanted to have shut down life, um, how in shut down life, life was just a little bit simpler. 
um, and a little bit smoother as far as like you just knew that there was nowhere else to go, but like kind of your home. Um, so so it's it's been, it's been quite dynamic to kind of have to wrestle with all of that. Yeah, Keith, how are you? Back in New York for a week. I'm great. I'm not sure. I'm having a little bit of uh, audio and visual issues on my end, so I hope I'm coming in clearly. Yeah. We hear you perfectly. Thank you so oh, much. Um, okay, and, and I'll let you guys be the, the barometer of how I'm being received. Thank but, you um, all again, you know, for, for being here. We also, as we always do, we would like to acknowledge um, the, 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 the Napi people upon whose land we are gathered today and we respect and pay respect to the uh, Lenape people, ancestors, past, present, and future. It's an important uh, reminder we always have here. And today, now we really look at the work, you know, of uh, uh, Shade, her work also for the National, uh, for the Coalition of Theaters of Color here in New York. And I hope um, you will uh, 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 have a conversation that tells us a little bit more, so we learn a little bit more about, you know, what the work is all about, but also how you, what you feel and where Black Theater is at the moment, where it's going to. I'm gonna blend out, but Shadi, maybe show up the award to our audience. Uh, we think we brought it over yesterday, so it's yeah. a real. Also, um, for for you to know, we at the Seagulls that don't just give the award itself. It comes also. Um, was a $1,500 endowment that is really towards buying books, going out, seeing things, doing research, and um, connecting as a, a really as an, as an encouragement. And uh, it means a lot to us. We think your work is truly significant and um, important, especially in the time we are in. It has always been. Um, but um, now, of course, uh, we look even uh, with closer eyes to it. So I'll let you... Um, to the conversation, uh, Jonathan and uh, Shade and Keys, and uh, goodbye. And I'm going to listen, and I can't wait to hear what you all have to say. Again, congratulations from our staff, from everybody, HowlRound, and the New York Theater community for um, for the contribution um, you make and for sharing and for caring. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. So honored. I mean, I... So, I mean, I would love to just start by, by just, like, if you could just paint a picture for us, Shade, as far as, like, how have you navigated this pandemic? Like, I mean, there has been a huge, as a witnesser of looking at what you have done day in and day out, is profound sensibility of nuance, of thoughtfulness, of compassion, of rigor, of holding the post, um, of actually becoming a new human <laughs> and actually owning your destiny in so many ways. So like, if you could just paint like, and, and and there are many ways I can remind you of the, some of the things that you have been able to accomplish. But like, if you could just paint a picture for us as, as far as like, what has been this moment of pandemic, but also what has this been this moment of holding um, this huge space that your mom um, tra transitioned and left uh, for you to steward and mantle and how you have created a definitive space for yourself inside of that, but also a definitive space for not just yourself, but for actually the legacy of Black theater and also for people of African descent and ultimately for human transformation? Well, that's a big question. Um, and I think it's a question for all of us to kind of wrestle with. I think as we dive in here, I just want to acknowledge that this award is um, so moving to me because one of the hats that I get the privilege to wear is to be the chair of the Coalition of Theaters of Color CTC is an organization or is a coalition that's been around since 2004, started by really interrogating just that question and that condition mm. in 2004 by the great, the late great Ruby D and Ossie Davis. And so for their 50th wedding anniversary, they were, they, as artists that meet activism in active practice, they decided to dedicate their 50th anniversary to doing a fundraiser for um, black theaters. Um, because we, they as practicing artists and activists understood that the underinvestment in our spaces um, was unacceptable and that, you know, um, they were two living artists that not only talk the talk, they always walk the walk. And that first anniversary fundraiser 
planted the seeds for what a coalition of advocacy could be, not only for Black theaters, but for culturally specific theaters in New York. And so the CTC was born. And um, about, and it was founded um, by nine culturally specific theaters, some of which are still in existence, some of which are not. Um, everyone from uh, Gertrude Drunette's Hadley Players and Paul Robeson Theater, right? That we no longer unfortunately have um, um, in our community the way we once had, but theaters like the National Black Theater, the New Federal Theater, the New Heritage Theater, Billie Holiday and the Black Spectrum Theater, are some of the founding theaters, then you add Latinx theaters with Thalia and Saya um, to create this coalition and really advocate. You know, I didn't realize before the pandemic, to your question, Jonathan, the importance of coalition building and advocacy. Mm building community within the communities that we represent to be stronger forces. Um, and the coalition started out as these nine theaters. We protested, we advocated for the New York City government to recognize us and the inequities in a real way that it was unacceptable that the city would talk about the inequities and you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, and not be putting their money where their mouth is. And um, Dominique Recchia, a council person, really understood that and turned our protests, turned our wounds into, and heard them, heard our wounds as wisdom, and created the first cultural initiative in the city budget. And it's called the Coalition of Theaters of Color. It started out as almost half a million dollars that would go to these culturally specific theaters. And I am so proud to say today, the Coalition of Theaters of Color represent 52 culturally specific theaters across all five boroughs. And with the help of our friends in government, really the leadership of Lori Cumbo, the majority leader, I have to say all of this because it's just true. And the advocacy of council person and uh, cultural chair, Jimmy Van Bramer, this year we had in a year where, and, I'll, and it tells you about the work of the coalition, but also what this last year has been, through our advocacy, through our activism, we have grown that budget initiative with the leadership of the city council to be um, uh, $5.7 million. Of wow. Funding that goes directly to the work, the preservation, the artistry of culturally specific theaters within the coalition. So I am over the moon that you know, that historical moment in time where things are getting cut, the recognition of the work of our theaters are growing. Um, and so much of this last year has been beating that drum, not only for the work mm. that the National Black Theater does, but on behalf of culturally specific theaters from Native American to Latinx to Asian Pacific to Asian theaters to Black theaters um, in this way. Again, shout out to Black, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus within the City Council. Without your dedication and commitment to the work that we do, we would not have been able to be in this moment. So thank you for uh, honoring the work of the CTC. I get to chair it um, for the time being, but I am but I am just one of 52 um, organizations doing the good work and fighting the good fight. Um, and so that's been the last, that's been really beating that drum. In addition to the work we get to do at National Black Theater, that has been the last two years educating our friends in government and our cultural friends at PWIs that our work is the work, right? And that we all have to come around the same watering hole and beat that same drum. In a year of, tw of, of, of fiscal year 21, where we had a full shutdown of arts and culture um, and our budgets were being cut sometimes as big a cut as 50% of cultural budgeting, um, you know, the city heard us that we said, listen, in the wake of everything you know to be true,
You have the mm. power of the artist. You have the power of storytelling. That your budgets, when you go into those rooms and you vote on your budget and what you're gonna cut, understand it's a moral document. And yeah, what yeah, yeah. What story do you want to tell in your budget? Because if you laud us for being storytellers and cultural and cultural shapers, understand you have that same power with the story that you write with the budget. And so in FY21, we were the only cultural initiative in the whole New York City budget that didn't get cut. And then they came even stronger this year around in FY22 and increased our funding by $2 million direct funds to these 52 organizations. So anyway, that's my soapbox. Thank you, Asi Davis and Ruby D. Thank you, ancestors. And really thank you to, most importantly, the 52 organizations that continue to be doing the frontline work in our communities to keep arts, culture, and specifically theater alive, authentically so. Okay, I got that out of the way. Welcome back, Keith. Thanks. We're just we're Thanks. checking in about how how we are and how we have right. navigated the last year and a half of COVID. I just you know was talking about the work of the CTC, um, and I know that we all have navigated it differently. So I'm gonna throw that question over to you. How are you? How is the condition of who you are, and right. how has the last year and a half been for you? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, please forgive me um, for my audio visual matrix issues. I don't know if this is a post full moon effect. Like, I don't know what's happening, um, but I'm glad to be back. And definitely uh, I've heard a lot of what you said about what was happening with um, MBT. Um, I think on the, the, uh, the new Blackfest front, um, you know, I'm pretty much a solo uh, operation with the help support of a couple of associate producers. And we've been very quiet, like, you know, when the pandemic happened and initially we shut down, I'm just one of those people who troubleshoot very quickly and I could see the future. I was like, okay, we need to shut down and just kind of take our time, kind of think about it, kind of, you know, um, read the room, read the global room. Um, and and then from there, we um, all decided to pause it, like just pause and let's kind of rethink what the New Black Fest means. Like, what does it mean to be normally, um, putting a light on social justice issues that are national and international. But now there's this larger phenomena at play that's almost in a way um, both um, shadowing social justice, but also reshaping social justice, right? Because now you have issues about healthcare inequities and all these things that happened during the pandemic that was quite visible then. So for us, we just decided to pause until it was important that we knew exactly where we what we were re-entering, what the world we were actually re-entering, and then kind of reimagining and curating our normal programming based on the the real world. And we're still trying to kind of figure what that what that is because things are still changing constantly and transitioning constantly. Um, but so so on that front, the front of just sort of like programming and, and where we are on that on that front, that's what that is. On a personal level, um, Keith as human being, Keith as artist, Keith as artistic sort of uh, leader, if that one would call me that, um, I've had a, an, an ample amount of time to really mm. dig deep and really like return to some big emotional, moral mm. questions for myself that, you know, you know, and as we all know as artists, like our moral sort of, um, our moral architecture and our emotional architecture and our spiritual architecture are things that inform our art. And during this pandemic, I was sort of, you know, dropped hard on the ground, like, oh, yo, Keith, you need to rethink your moral situation here. You need to think your emotional situation, you need to rethink your spiritual situation. So I feel like I've come out of this pandemic or I've coming, um, I'm rising up at this point in the pandemic a, a bit more evolved than I was 18 months ago, mm. from a spiritual, emotional, and moral tip. Um, and I feel much more confident about myself. I feel much more, um, guided as far as like what I want as a human being, what I want in my art, what I want in the TV and film world, how I want to participate in that. Um, it's got things just have gotten really, really focused for me. And and recently, as we probably all know now, the Lark Play Development Center um, are closing their doors, which has been outside of the National Black Theater and the Siegel Theater um, Center have been you know collaborators and sort of housed us. 
now we don't have that house anymore, right? We don't have that place to fall and sort of like lean into. And so we're kind of on our own again, which is great. Um, luckily, we still have you all who continue to so sort of open your doors and you know open your Always. ears to whatever we have going on. Always. But also the Apollo Theater has been um, instrumental yes. now. I think in yes. all of our sort of um, rethinking about what we're doing and how we do it, you know, and how we yeah. collaborate with each other. So. Yeah, I, I think that's really powerful. Jonathan and I often say the shift is hitting the fan. <laughs> that's what been this last two years. Like the shift is hitting the fan. Right. And the shift is important. And the shift is it is it looks a lot like a lot like you have described in all the um in all of the ways. Jonathan, I'm gonna to throw to you and say, talk, can you talk a little bit about the power of the pause? Your thoughts, both artistically, <laughs> artistically and uh, personally, the power of the pause. And there really has been a lot of power as you've kind of described it, Keith, in these last two years, as much as there has been really hard times. So right. part of the pause, Jonathan. I mean, I will say, I mean, the power of the pause for me was has, has been really reflective and also been, I, I've taken it as a cocoon <laughs> and I've been like, and I, and I have been positing for those who might, who, who might um, have heard me talk before is just like, what was this moment if it wasn't a gift to really um, do what caterpillars do inside of cocoon and um re-augment, re-strengthen, find new bones, strengthen, find new colors um, that I that create that create the authentic representation of yourself so that when you come mm -hmm. out of this cocooning process, you get to become you get to live inside of an essence of the butterfly. Um, and what I love about that idea and the ideology is that the butterfly isn't isn't um is graceful, is transformative, but also is delicate still. It still has a softness to it. Um, that you don't come into this new this new world that actually has that that we're all interacting with um, that that comes on the other side of the shutdown, not the pandemic, but the shutdown. Um, uh, how this how how do you engage this new world in, in a really beautifully authentic, rigorous, and present pulse way that feels full of thoughtfulness and compassion? Um, I think that uh, you know on a lot of on a lot of ways like. I feel like my job transformed. Um, I feel like my my what what I was actually really being asked to do of being present for artists and being present to my to the company in which I serve. Um, those two things uh, totally took another took another deep a deep dive, a uh, beautiful twist. Uh, wanting more, needing more, wanting me to show up more, needing me to show up more, um, and trying to figure out what does actual transformative care look like. What does what does what does what what does care look like that is not um, prescriptive, but is very much um, uh, that is that is very much uh, allowing for um, someone to show up in their wholeness and for you to start creating um, parameters and programming um, that allows for allows for their unique IP to be um, cared for illuminated and show and showing up so what have i done during the pandemic i've also like you know discovered what radio plays feel like again um and really delving into what radio plays look like as an actual creative space for black artists to really own and hone and and be a participant inside of um i've also i've also ventured into film uh since the pandemic um in the midst of, in the midst of the pandemic um being given an opportunity to do um, a residency at All Arts um, and be able to do a, a short, um, which is something that was, I, I didn't, I would never say I, I didn't think I would ever do, but the fact that I am doing it now, that's like feels like totally new and different um, and exciting. Um, and also, and, and also creating conditions at MBT to, uh, to really uh, make sure the individual artist is not left to the wayside um, in the midst of all of this shutdown or progress. Um, that that as we as institution builders move our move our organizations forward in our very respective ways, um, that we think about how we can do um, uh, micro support to macro support. So we started mm -hmm. a resident a reading series program where we gave twenty three black playwrights during the pandemic during the shutdown in particular. And we're continuing it. Um, past that, but 23 Black playwrights, a space to do micro development, which gave them outside of our residency program, uh, we were able to support more, <laughs> create create more more space, um, and giving them our Zoom, giving them uh, giving the playwrights money, giving the director money, giving actors money, just to play for six hours, 
Um, and then with no commitment of like saying like, you have to show us something, you have to do something like just have six hours just to generate narrative, generate something that like, if we're, if we're going to be in a shutdown moment, let us walk out of it. Again, thinking about the caterpillar analogy of coming out of the cocoon, the husk of that cocoon, let us come out of there with new narratives, stronger narratives, more focused right. narratives, um, so that the American theater can actually, um, have a fertile ground to start to, um, really address uh our now state instead of our past state um and i think that's been the interesting thing with the reopening um has been looking at the plethora of work that is happening like you can feel the the the, the true divergence of if it was supposed to be produced before the pandemic if it and if it was produced in response to the pandemic and if it's been and if it's in response and it's also responding to creating space for our trauma that we went through or the grief that we went through because of the show going through right yeah going yeah. through. <laughs> absolutely i i want to i want to just oh there's so much here both of you in your responses talk about care and um keith you were talking about your emotional and your spiritual architecture Mm -hmm. And Jonathan, you were talking about aftercare and responsive care, not only to yourself, but to the community of people and artists and audiences. I think that that, that is a very unique way of working blackly, right? Mm -hmm. That we now get an opportunity to have these conversations that are streamed all over the world about our work practice being, you know, linked so closely, you know, irreparably linked. Is that a word? I don't know if that's the right word. Um, it, 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 will, it will be the word. word. <laughs> but it is the word now <laughs> right. with the architecture and the foundation of our, uh, our, our, uh, of our spirit and our emotions that we can't actually be responsible leaders without incorporating as a foundational principle care right. and i think that yes. that to me if that is something that came out of this pandemic that not only the three of us in our respective roles are talking about personally but pouring that into our organizations and saying hey whatever partnership wherever whatever space we go into that is a part of the equation i think is really powerful right. and is a takeaway from a conversation like this if you're not having conversations about your spiritual emotional care and architecture what are we building mm -hmm. how are we building back differently mm -hmm. um and that makes me think about this other thing that i really want us to dive into because i don't feel like we're having these conversations publicly after the murder of George Floyd, our communities erupted in protest and our responsiveness to those protests were a part of a continuum that we saw for the first time globally people participating in. Mm -hmm. And you touched on that and the work of the New Black Vest works with these issues of social justice. What has it been like through the innovation of care, through the innovation of protest, and these very particular conditions that have put us in virtual spaces to grow not only our audiences globally, but to see the work of our activism being globally mm. ignited? How mm -hmm. has that, for both you and Jonathan, uh, Keith, for, for you and Jonathan, how has that affected? Um, the way in which you think about producing, the kind of work you think about producing, and what role does a global audience have in, um, yeah, how you think mm -hmm. about what you want to put forward and the mediums in which you want to work? Mm -hmm. Jonathan, do you want to start or? I don't know. I'll let you go first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. I mean, you know, that's an that's an amazing um, question, and. You know, I think about initially, yeah, after the George Floyd global outrage that happened that we all witnessed, um, you know, for, for the New Black Fest in particular, um, I wanted to, like, you know, recently we were commissioned by the Apollo, I was commissioned by the Apollo New Black Fest to curate um, 
part of their new season at the new victory, right? And so in in sort of in um in template, what we normally do is normally social justice, sort of inspired work, things that are happening now, the now of it all. And because George Floyd happened and then the pandemic happened and the shutdown happened, it was very important to me in the, in the context of care to allow the writers to take their time mm. in discovering and deciding what, they, what they wanted to discuss in this sort of what's happening now curation. Um, I didn't want to prompt them while all that was happening because I felt like normally as black, or historically as black and brown and people of the African diaspora and the brown diaspora were often responding very quickly to what's happening in front of us and changing laws and moving our families or whatever the situation sort of um, you know necessitates. But I did want to, even though there was a part of me that wanted to sort of like let these writers just sort of unleash like, exactly how they were feeling, but they have been doing that for so for so much for the last decade in context mm. of the new blackness. There was always like immediate urgency, and I felt like I wanted them to take the time to take care of their spirits because this mm -hmm. was, it was overwhelming that global outrage. It was amazing, but also overwhelming because it was like oh once again this is happening to us. Once again, once a week almost, right? Yeah. But this sort of like iconic event is happening to us once again. Now the world is outraged by it. And it's time for us to just sit back and pause and just really pause um, and just take it all in and understand what our next moves are. Yeah. And really, um, but even outside of all that, because the sort of the social justice urgency to it all is definitely important and paramount, but we are also human beings. We're also individual specimens on this planet. And we also are feeling and responding to all the things like everybody else from the weather to the climate change, to the, you know, the environment, to the unrest, like all of that's happening to us, just like it's happening to everybody else on the globe. But we have the ad added burden of having to navigate and deal with um, unwarranted policing and attacking of our bodies and our communities. Mm. So for me, again, just to underline, like it was so important that people in my, at least in my community, paused, mm -hmm. paused, take a, took a breath, um, checked in with themselves in order to then step forward, as you're mentioning Sade, and figure out the next plan of action and what does that look like now, now that we have global sort of a global look, a global sort of illumination of what's going on. What does that look like now? Does it sound the same? Is it shaped the same? Is the, are the stories the same? Like, you know, are we still talking just to each other? Or now are, we talk, are, are we now talking to the global community? Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I think I, I, I'll say all that and I'll kind of, I'll land my plane with that for now, but. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I think what's powerful about that is two things. One of the things that was so incredible to see in my own generation, because perhaps our parents saw it a little bit, was how this global movement was really a global movement and to see our white brothers and sisters pick up the picket signs and be on the front lines, it actually gave us space to breathe. Like yes. I was like, y'all, this is your fight. Yes. And you y'all need to be on the front line. <laughs> and what we need to do is pause and take care because this it what you have experienced as trauma porn is our like what you're yes. experiencing as violence is trauma porn in our lives that we are living in and have to protect our babies. Exactly. So while we are worried about our babies, y'all be on the front line. And I thought for me that was catalytic and it didn't feel like my role as a black woman and a mother was to do anything but pause right. and to take care of me and mine. And me right. and mine looks like like yes. our community. The other thing I just wanna point out, cause I wanna get Jonathan in here. I know he has so much to say is, this is why I think it was so important. And again, thank you, Jonathan and uh, Keith. We wanted to do this conversation live so it could be on HowlRound. Cause we understand we have brothers and sisters all over the globe tuning right. in to watch this conversation right. and that our the condition our condition is the condition yes, because absolutely. we're all so connected and we have learned that through the last year 
and a half. Um, but oh, I want to yeah. throw it to you, Jonathan, to get some thoughts on it. And then I want to share a little story about National Black Theater of Sweden in regards to this. Go ahead, Jonathan. Okay, nice. You're muted, my sweet. There we go. I have a mute button. I think you you think you I would have known that by now. And <laughs> two years of being virtual, hey, I would have learning really curve, kids. That. Learning the curve. learning curve is <laughs> real. I mean, what I, what I what I think about it is really important, um, and and really bloody on the conversation that we're talking about, and like, how can we be any more structured than the planet that holds us, right? And the planet that holds us is going through, I think, Keith, you brought this up um, in other conversations I've had with you, and I really appreciate it and made me think about how how can I find structure? The planet that I'm actually that holds me, that's actually my fertile ground, is chaotically having a cathartic moment. And I should be going through car I, I I'm going through a car like there's a there, there there's a there there's a cathartic moment happening inside of my system. And that, that cathartic it doesn't mean it's peaceful. Doesn't mean that it's full of full of uh, roses or <laughs> that it feels good, right? That it means that there is a friction that's happening on a on a the nature is teaching me that I am internally and a part of um, a systematic rebirthing and a regeneration. And that regeneration, if I'm humble enough, may include me or may not. And am I okay with that contribution that I will give to that regeneration? Because is my and what is my goal inside of at the end at the at the at the end of the finish line i think that's what COVID really made me clear about and the shutdown really made me clear about like during the shutdown i had to do i had to move and, and my i had to move locations and there was a moment this might feel kind of morbid but there was this moment where i was like the world might end and if the world ends i'm not the kind of person that's going to like be fighting my way against over a wall because i don't want to like i'm not going to be that person like that's just not me i'm gonna do i'm gonna be like i've done my service <laughs> to God and country, and I'm ready to be released. Like, like I don't need to see what happens after the atomic bomb hits. Like, I don't need to see that. I, I can I, I can be, I, I, so what I did is that I, I created my home to be my temple. Like, I was like, I, I was thinking of the pyramids. I was thinking of, I was thinking of how, 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 how you generate a, a womb-like state that allows for regeneration to happen, but also legacy and spirituality to be housed and home. And how, and what would it mean to imagine um, the freed black space in which I'm able to occupy this home in which I'm able to call, be have the privilege to call my home. What if it was etched with the DNA of my liberation? What if it was etched with the DNA of my freedom and where I right. envision my life to be? So that, so that, so that, so that regardless of what happens to the world outside of me, because the world outside of me, I can't control. What is the spaces in which I can create conditions so that I can find my freedom and I know my liberation? I mean, what's really quite beautiful and I, I'm going maybe on a little tangent and making me think about this, but it made me think about the power of the ring shout. Shade and I are working on this project um, at the Apollo Theater, which is called The Gathering Sonic Ring Shout. Um, and it's making me think about how we as Black people have the opportunity, have, have inside of us a DNA of understanding how to shift the modality of, of oppression as a means um, not to be our destination, but to create safe containers inside of that disrupt it as our normal way of being. And I, and I'll only bring up the ring shot as an example. Mm -hmm. um, so the ring shot for folks who might not know about the ring shot, um, the ring shot was a technology that was brought over by, by, by in, um, during the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you can find a, a lot of it indigenously housed and on the wet, on Ivory Coast and, and, and most of West Africa. Um, but during this trans, transatlantic slave trade, many black folks um, on that treacherous journey brought over a, a technology that would allow for them during the antebellum South to find their liberation in the midst of slavery. So what would happen is that many black and brown folks would, after working the till on the cotton, on the cotton field, they would go out into the bushes, into the trees, into the dark of night, when after working in the sunlight, right? Again, just want to paint the conditions of what resilience, what joy, and what magic lives inside of the human body and condition of the black body in particular. So after doing all that labor, we'll go out into the field find a sacred space that they wouldn't deem as sacred, create a perimeter around that sacred space and start to and start to enact their liberation, their church, their space where they can reclaim their body, reclaim their spirit, reclaim the spaces in which they have been, they've been whipped, lashed, um, de degraded, and knowing that in the morning that they would go back to being a part of a system. Knowing that in the morning they would be going back to being part of picking that cotton and being a part of that industrial system that they would never, that they 
would not claim any kind of residuals out of, right? They would just, again, be a product inside that, inside, a clog inside that wheel. And why I say all that to say, why I lift that up as a, as a modality is that when I hear you talk, Keith, about the need for the pause or the need for the reframe or the need for creating that space for your own healing, when I think about the work that, that, that you have been doing, Sade, and I think about my own and individual practice of this cocooning, um, I think of three individuals, and there are probably multiple ways in which we have done that, and multiple, if we had more time, we had many more folks on this, we could probably figure out multiple ways of interventions, but how, 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 we, have, how we have been deliberate in wanting to activate our joy as a sacred act of thrivability, and how we need to activate our joy as, yeah. a, as a sacred act of how we thrive and how we can thrive. Yeah, mm -hmm. as resistance, as resilience, as our weapon, our joy, right? Mm -hmm. The un mm -hmm. unbreakable joy of Black folks mm -hmm. is the privilege that we get to work in the legacy and the continuum of. Right. Um, yeah, I just want, can I just before, yeah, I, go I just want to um, tag into what you and John they were just talking about and this idea of nature being okay. the, the real leader. Um, as far as uh, motivation and aggressive resilience, okay. right? It's like, it's like you know, um, and also like the pausing, right? Because even nature pauses. <laughs> it's yes. like, you know, so let me just make up a lot of noise. And if, <laughs> and, and, and and if you're not going to hear me, I'm going to make yes. even more noise. And yes. I'm sorry, folks. Yes. I know y'all. some of y'all been on my side and advocating for me. So y'all just ride with the ride, because trust me, I'm taking you to the place you need to go, right? Yes. <laughs> and for me, it's just, I so appreciate you, Jonathan, sort of illuminating that and just, you know, Sade just kind of like putting another light on this idea of pause and motivation as the new liberation, right? And so I just feel like nature is our guide. Like nature mm. right now is being un unapologetic about mm. its need to recraft and recurate its, its existence. And it doesn't mm. care whose feelings it hurts. It doesn't <laughs> care. <laughs> Not at all. No, it well, and that's care. the power of storytelling, right? right? Authentic storytelling. The earth is telling an authentic story right now. Exactly. And it's shaping all of our conditions because it's unapologetic. Exactly. That is why what we do is a reflection of yes. and is essential the way nature is essential because it is course correcting yes. whether you like it or not yes. how shit is right? yes <laughs> I, I just want to i also just want to uplift this one this very real thing that as you talk about course correction you also talk about blessing you also talk about pause right is that is that the the beauty of because when i when i just think about this pause that happened and also the amount and we can i, I don't want to ever forget this because this make this reminds me of how privileged and blessed i am the amount of people who were who transitioned throughout this period. Yeah. There, 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 there's a huge amount of people who transitioned in this period. However, and not however, and the universe is abundant and it's like creating equal balance. Meaning that the folks who got to survive, what privilege do we now have and being able to have access to our breath? What 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 transformation are is called on our lives that we were saved on so many ways to not be a part of that huge vacuum of folks who would transition and who and who are now guiding us in different ways and a part of this conversation in different ways um and what do and what it, it makes it makes me really really get humbled in a lot of ways of mm. like well then what is my charge to do on this planet how am i supposed to take rest restoration how am i supposed to take care of my health my own life how am i supposed to take care of the health of my family and the people that i love in what ways do I have, in what ways am I the, the, the lucky one inside of this conversation when there were, and, and knowing that balance was created, balance was a part of it because we sometimes we put good and bad out there and we say that was good and that was bad, but how, but what if it was all just part of the equation of equal, right? What if it was part of an equation of, of not good or bad, but just life on life's terms? What if mm -hmm. we had to wrestle with that? Because if it didn't happen, what transformation or innovation would not happen? Like we wouldn't be doing this kind of virtual life or virtual innovation if it didn't happen. We would it would have happened down the road, but there was an acceleration that was necessary yeah. that 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 energy yeah. felt. 
Oh, right. no, no, no. You're yeah. like, this is why yeah. I, I'm so glad we're talking to each other. And there's also this, this introducing the concept of discomfort across yeah. the board for yeah. all of us to lean into yeah. right. and have a love affair with discomfort. If not mm. only to have a leveling of mm. what it might be like to walk in the shoes right. of other folks who right. live in a space of ultimate discomfort, ultimate yes. otherness, yes. in order to have a shared human experience, yes. Yes. whether that's happening okay. on the level of racial reckoning, um, environmental reckoning, like okay. what are the people yes. in the Amazon have been dealing with for generations right. Right? because of big oil, right? Yes. What is that discomfort? Yes. Right? Yes. So what does famine look like in Africa that we experience in the hurricane wow. of Ida today? Like what wow. is yes. happening? Yes. What and, and I want and I and, and I want us all to just dive into that because I'm gonna steer this a little bit, but, can, but like what does <laughs> right. that, what are the questions that are not being asked? What are right. the conversations that are not being had that we get the privilege in this moment in time to ask and to have? Which yeah. is what this is an extension of, and 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 how are we right sizing and course correcting yes. through our observation and experiences of the last years? Right. Keith, I know, get in there. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean no, I'm just uh, yeah, just pull, pulling from what you're saying. Like I mean, what I was thinking about was this idea of what Jonathan was talking about. Um, how do we take advantage, or how do we honor the breath that we were given dur during the situation where so many people transition? And I think there's something to say about leadership, right? Because I think there was a recent quote I heard online, and I think it made from a hip hop artist, but they mentioned something about stepping into your, stepping into the position that you're in. Like as opposed to like, oh no, I ain't really got that kind of power. No, you do got that power. And I think we're yeah. at a time right now that you have to accept, those of us who are leaders, have, particularly artistic leaders, have to accept that we are in a position of power and we are in a position to be heard. We are in a position to point in a certain direction or whatever direction that is. And, and really stepping into that and really bringing with that um, our sort of collective desire for the future, right? Our collective okay. desire for the present. But, but my bigger point of all that is to say that everything you mentioned, Shade, about all the, dis, the, the discourse and the discomfort globally that people have been experiencing for millenniums, right? Not just brown and black people, but there's Whites who have also experienced discourse in the Appalachian Mountains, dis discomfort in the Appalachian Mountains, in the eastern part of Europe, in the northern part of, uh, you know, southern part of Asia that connects to Russia. Like, you know, what I mean, there's a lot of people who have been experiencing um, discomfort. And I think that the more articulate and unafraid and unapologetic about what we need to do, whether or not people listen to us or not. As leaders, we just still have to put it out there and yes. hopefully, you know what I mean? Like, I just wanted to say that, like, just, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, we have about like 12 minutes left. So there's a topic okay. I wanna talk about, but yeah. just to put a pin on it, I know that we are both working with an incredible playwright right now, James Imes. And as you guys are, I love, like yes. a blessing love to them. the world, if folks are listening to us, get into James Imes. Yes. Um, but as Jonathan is asking us to ask the question, how do you turn ghosts into ancestors? How do you transform ghosts into ancestors? And what is the role of this vacuum that has sucked all of these souls to the other side? I think of some of James's work mm -hmm. and really contemplating not the moment of trauma and tragedy, but the resurrection of possibility out of it. Right, and so yes. I just wanted yeah. to center an artist who's incredible that we're both working with in this moment. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is where I really want to get into in these last minutes that we have left. <laughs> this, for the majority of folks who are experiencing our talk are also experiencing an unprecedented representation of black theater, especially in the commercial space. And so Broadway has an unprecedented seven black plays and shows on Broadway and folks are calling it a renaissance. I know I'm stirring it up right now. <laughs> and I just was wondering if you guys could reflect on what's happening from your vantage point right now. And if we can talk a little bit about from your perception, the difference between black plays and black theater um, and what are the questions that are not being asked 
And what are the conversations that want to be had that are, are getting lost in translation? Yo. One can die. Just throw I'm going to let Jonathan start with that. What? Oh my goodness. Um, I think I think I think that there becomes a very need a needed a needed perspective of wanting to understand how calling out creates a mechanism for people to work from not an authentic space of really wanting to create transformation, but trying to just put a bandaid over a situation. They're just trying to they're just trying to shut it up. They're just trying to like you think about like sometimes sometimes instead of actually healing the situation, you just try to put a bandaid over it because you're like I don't want to bleed anymore. Like stop making me bleed. I don't care. Just like take care of it. And I think that when we're thinking about how some of these plays are being brought on, or how plays, or how the plays are being taken care of in the larger uh, ec and ecosystem and ecology, we're seeing that band aid kind of happen um, quite rapidly and aggressively. And in doing that, the care that would not necessarily be taken um, to make sure that it feels whole, that it feels taken care of, that it feels um, that it feels like it is uh, dramaturgically and also spiritually and also community wise, well done and thoughtful in that way. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily being done. I think there, there's an element of sensationalism that's happening inside of uh, sensationalizing black trauma, sensationalizing black thought, sensationalizing black, black, black IP, um, that, uh, that, that it would be quite, um, that I don't, that, that and that socialization, you can see the demarcation in some spaces. It goes back to, was this a pre-pandemic play or was this a play that was made for this time? This moment in time that we're actually dealing with, this moment in time that we're actually addressing with the human condition. Like we're allowing this art to give us a, a glimpse into the human condition of where we are today. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm challenged by, I'm challenged by the disparity between that curatorial lens. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not equal. It is very much wobbly. And as I try, and as I seek to, and I think I try to seek to do this and people might, you know, everyone has their point of view, but it's my mission. So it's my life, it's how I want to do it. I try to uplift every black artist I possibly can. I try to uplift them in how, and how I come to witness their work. If I can carve out as many hours as I can to do that, I try to do that in how I try to give opportunity, provide opportunities um, for black artists to uh, to do their work and a black artist should be able to 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 fail forward um, my question is, is that do we have a mechanism that allows them to fail forward and not for that to be their destination um do we have a mechanism to capture failure not as a way in which that tarnishes one's career but a way in which for us and i don't know if we evolved yet to that point but 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 when we look at when we look at these I, let's honestly if we look at the reviews that have come out all around black work in the New York market, in particular, none of them, a lot, uh, some of them, some of them have been quite harsh to to black playwrights, in particular. Um, and I wonder, with those conditions um, actually out there in the world, will those black playwrights have, have be given the same kind of privilege that white playwrights, white identified playwrights, have been able to have to fail multiple times, um, be invested in multiple times. Um, knowing that a trajectory of someone's career is not made off one play, trajectory of someone's career and their mm. ability to hone their their voice is made off a durational period. Um, and so how are we turning these investments of these moments that are popping up into durational opportunities to develop the human, not just to develop your guilt outside of your white supremacist lens? And if we're not having a conversation about developing the human, then this is a momentary conversation that's actually harmful and we're creating harmful conditions for black bodies to engage with and making us think that it is revolutionary when actually it is it's deteriorating the kind of soulfulness of the black art. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, pulling pulling some from Jonathan, I have many thoughts about what's happening <laughs> as far as at the Broadway. You know, I think, it, I think it's, I think it, on, on one level, it is an amazing thing to have um, so many stories that are quote unquote black stories on Broadway because that's not something that Broadway normally sort of um, advocates for, particularly if they're not musical, right? So there's a lot of so-called drama type plays right now, which is, you know, kind of revolutionary in context to how Broadway produces. Um, you know, I, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy for, for that on a sort of intellectual, sort of intellectual level. And I'm also, you know, thrilled that so many black theater practitioners that I know personally or in my community or in our community 
who are actually working right now, right? Who are actually making those Broadway salaries, that weekly salaries that are now able to afford their, you know, their children's, you know, college tuition and whatever that is, right? Like eat better, you know, all of those things yes. which really, really matter for artists. So on, so on an emotional level, I'm happy for that. I think, you know, um, uh, uh, um, I think it also is important for me to think about the difference between, Rashada, you mentioned the difference between Black story and Black plays and that, that sort of differentiation. Like for me, like Black story is about bearing witness and it's about which sort of like is in the tradition of the black church on Wednesday night when people come to bear witness to what's happened this week and seek out some redemption or some sense mm. of inspiration, right? Or some arc of change. Like for me, oh, like yeah. that is black story. That's all story, but black story in particular, that it's important that it functions that way. And I'm normally able to detect that when I see a play that this is a bearing of witness of an mm. artist. I am also able to detect when plays are curated, using Jonathan's language, curated in a way that is feeding the white gaze and white consumption. Exactly. That it doesn't matter that black people are in the audience or not. It doesn't matter that this is very <laughs> witness or not. This is just about me sort of unloading whatever angst I may have about my own blackness and often it's, it often is self-hate, it's sort of like anti-blackness which is understandable because we all have some residue of anti-Blacks because we're part of a colonialist, colonialism and systemic racism. So that does exist. But then you have situations where most white people are not aware of how colon settler colonialism works and how anti-Blackness works under a systemic racist society. So then they advocate for voices that I feel are often unevolved voices or voices that are stuck in their anti-blackness and they don't know how to move out of that because they have all these okay. white people or white institutions and not all white people. I'm just talking about sort of the sort of structural systemic whiteness that programs who sort of like thumbs up. That's an amazing story. That's a provocative story. And they're not thinking about the impact that type of um, what I call unloading or unleashing that isn't really about bearing witness. It's about like, well, I feel safe enough in this white space to say these things, but I know I can't say that among black people because they ain't gonna accept me and all that kind of like strange sort of like ideology. But, um, but that to me is what I feel that's happening right now on Broadway. There's like a nice slice of great sort of like bear witnessing, people just telling their stories, people like, you know, showing this is who black people are, this is my black experience. But there's also this other thing that's happening where it's like white, systemic whiteness and consuming whiteness is lifting up this sort of story that isn't really about anything but pleasing and satisfying, tantalizing, freaking wit, whatever it is with the white, with the white gaze. And that is, to me is detrimental and dangerous and archaic. Now we're in this world of global sort of like expression and global sort of like alliances. Mm. Like, do we still need that? Like, do, or, mm. you know what I mean? And I don't want to police anybody because everybody should be able to write whatever they want, but everybody should also be able to critique whatever they see, right? And so what I'm critiquing <laughs> is, without putting any picture on anybody, because I'm sure, whatever, but I'm just saying that I think there is some um, interesting things happening that is not rooted in Black health or even global sort of uh, awareness. It's sort of like, let me just feed whiteness. And that Ashe. to me is problematic. Ashe. I can't believe we got that in. <laughs> First of all, that is a whole testimony. It is a whole thesis, both what you and Jonathan have raised into the space. And those are the questions that are not being asked or the conversations have it being had. And without those questions, those answers, interrogation, right. I fully believe we are causing violence, right? right? The speed by which we get there. And I just want to, if there's anything to contribute to both of what you said or to offer something, is what I take away from what Jonathan said is like, you know, culture versus strategy. Mm -hmm. Is what happening on Broadway a strategy that feeds into a larger colonial, colonial imperialistic capitalist agenda right. to satisfy stakeholders on for a whole list of in, in for a whole list of good reasons and profit driven reasons, right? right. 
Why are all the opening plays where we don't know what the atmosphere or the audience will be or the appetite will be post pandemic right. while folks are still sick? Right. The majority of the plays past this reopening experimental stage, do we still have a roster of, right. of, of black stories? Right. Are we asking each other the question, am I bearing witness? Who's yes. in the audience? If we're laughing, how are we laughing and who's laughing? Right. Those yes. questions. And then just to pull from what you brilliantly were saying, um, Keith, is also, this is something I've been thinking about and writing about, revolutionary acts versus transformative acts. Yes. And that the revolution, which is constantly pinned on black folks back is yes. always a target. And right. can there be sustainable change if you're always the revolutionary right. taking on that fire? Right. right. But right. what does transformational acts look like right. that creates sustainable shifts ch and changes, paradigm changes mm -hmm. that we can have conversations about black storytelling without it being tied to black profits and our audiences. So I'm just like, when do black people get to rest and not yes. have to be the revolution? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Because we're having generational conversations about yeah. how we transcend survival into thriving. And yes. we can't do that if yes. the North Star is always a white audience. Yes, 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 yes. Um. Yes, I mean, the North yes. Star is all the white audience. And the critique is always from a white gaze. I mean, I'm so, I am so tired of not being able to critically analyze a piece for both for both where it needs evolution and where it is, la where it's blind and where it sees, right? Where it wins, like we only say good or bad, like no, it, there's gray. <laughs> Why can't we live in a space yes. of gray? Because yes. because like that is not allowing for a wonderful, a wonderful like um, uh, 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 a wonderful reality check to show up that every we all have spaces of evolution that we need to evolve into, and 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 like. And like, if we're not able to critically look at and analyze the ways in which um, someone lives inside of a trajectory of work, right, a body of work, how, 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 how a piece is a part of a continuum, but also being able to talk about um, ways in which that individual, that individual piece, visual production, because I, I will say this, and I think this is the one main issue, and I'll pause and I'll stop right here. I think it's unfair, I think, for the playwright of a new play that that a review solely only kind of either good or bad talks about the playwright and doesn't give enough critique on the direction that's my personal opinion that like that like it really puts so much weight on the playwright to have to make it so well done when actually the embodiment of the world from it is from the vantage point of the director the director is the person that that made many of those choices that that the playwright is being an adverse like in reflection to and i think sometimes when i look at reviews i i i think we let we let we let a very critical voice off of the hook sometimes and we blame and we put so much weight on the playwright or 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 a spotlight on the playwright and we don't nuance the perspective to allow for to allow for it to be a shared weight that goes on with both the playwright and the director. That both of them. I want to just. I want to just also say that what folks don't know from an audience perspective, and I learned this firsthand on kind of the front lines of working with government through this moment in time, is that the product is not the process. And this is what you're saying, Jonathan, yes. because I also think these producers need to be held accountable about the resources that they're investing in a development process, right? right. Yeah. Because it's like, are these works developed in the same way, an right. enhancement product, uh, an enhancement production that has had years of, um, sorry, that has had years yeah. of development and workshop, right? This falls on the producer's uh, shoulders as well, not just the director or the playwright. And I guess, because I know we could talk about this forever. Forever. <laughs> forever and ever. I also just want to invite folks to say like, black folks and black culture isn't a box to be checked. 
which is why it's important to understand that part. the difference between culture, between black stories and witnessing yeah. and checking a box for your own sense of um, perceived responsibility in a reactive moment in time. Mm -hmm. That I promise you as Sade Lithcott as the National Black Theater, I will never call you out. I will yeah. always call you in because I see you as more than a box too. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She said she got real. She got real hood on us. She got stuck <laughs> the most hood. I ain't seen Shadi get that hood in a while. She went. Like, she did on me. Okay. All right. All right. I'm not a box. I, I'm gonna be a box on one. No, that's I, important. But, yeah, I want to give you um, and Jonathan the last words because I I also want to be respectful of you guys' time. Oh um, yeah. So Absolutely. Keith, I'm gonna give you a last word, and then Jonathan and Keith, you all get the last word, and and. Um, and I'll take us out when you are done. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, um, as a last word, I will say that, um, you know, this this time out or this this sort of active time out that's happening, right? Because this is not over, um, has been transformative um, and continues to be transformative for me as an individual, as a human being, as Jonathan mentioned, um, as an artist, as an artistic leader. Um, and it's really um, forced me to stand much stronger and much steadier in my truth, um, in my POV, um, in what I want for my own personal world, my, my communal world and my sort of artistic world, um, as far as um, accountability and authenticity and responsibility, um, but without judgment, um, also providing grace, because I think there's something to mm. this pandemic that really forced me to understand the importance of grace, um, particularly with people of color, particularly of people of the African I say. diaspora, I say. who have experienced for the last 400 plus years on, the, on an international level, because we are not the only ones who have been impacted by the Atlantic slave trade and colonialism, right? It has existed in other places and still exists there, that people need to be given grace and understand what that means. And, and that's why I even say earlier, when I was saying earlier about like what's happening on Broadway and me, me being able to differ, differentiate between the bare witness scene that's happening there and also the sort of the pandering to whiteness that's happening there and the pandering part, giving that grace, giving those artists grace, because I feel like there is still room for recognition um, or at least awareness, if that is indeed what they want, because at the end and of that's the day, what they want. some people uh, don't yeah. want that. Some people can be taken yeah. through a pandemic, a hurricane, a, a, a F5 tornado on the emotional level and a physical one, and still not want to change their game plan. Their game right. plan still uh, may be the North right. Star is whiteness. The North Star will always be whiteness. I don't care what back. you say, I don't care what kind of molasses you throw in my face, White, the white star is whiteness. So some, so some, some, because of thankfully grace would allow us, even those of us who want the best for our communities and each other to sit back and let that, let those folks and let those entities do what they got to do. But we're on another page, right? So I just want to say uh, at the end of the day, um, my last word is during this pandemic, during this shutdown, I have learned that grace mm. is the engine and the fuel to kickstart revolution, but more importantly, transformation. Ashe. Ashe. You said yes, Grace. We be, yes, because, Grace. Because also, I just want to say, and I might just want to amplify his last word as my last word, is that because we don't, you don't ever know what's inside so, what someone else has experienced. Right. And how that experience is creating the condition of what you are seeing as their reality. So they might not show up on time. They might, they might not respond to that email. They might not, but why are they not doing that? Uh, it's <laughs> like, you have no idea, and especially during this pandemic, if it's COVID, if it's a COVID scare, if it is the fact that like they're financially in a scare, if their health of their family's in a scare, if they just need mental rest because they've been on so many Zooms that they can't fathom how to move yeah. left, right, up and down, that, that, the, that the element of grace becomes deeply important to interrogate not only yourself, but how you are in relationship to life 
and mm. life is with individuals mm -hmm. life is with the planet life is with the your like your 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 dog or your cat or because there's a dog barking i'm just thinking about it so like how do you how do you embody grace as a mechanism of livable conditions yeah. and not a space where we kind of just again to your point Chade, just check a box just right. like say they're not doing this they're not doing this they're not doing this, so i'm gonna ride them off no how are we creating graceful conditions for them to be vulnerable and have radical candor be a part of their everyday being. If we can create a space for radical candor to show up, we will all breathe differently and we would start to move transformatively to a resolve that would allow for us to not have this be our story anymore. This right. is only showing up again in our historical memory because the universe is telling us you didn't learn the first time. So I'm going to yes. replay 1968 to happen in 2020. And let me see if you can wait, if you wake up this time. And if you don't, I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to make it bigger and I'm going to make it bigger. Do we want it to be that big? And, I, and that's the question that I ask. Right. Wow. I got grace, right? Um, as I, I know I promised folks a quick story about National Black Theater of Sweden, which I will deliver in my closing remarks, framed by grace. That's the thing about, <laughs> the thing about grace is that it's the alchemy of our humanity. Yes. Grace is something we can all afford. Yes. Grace is what this pandemic has given us yes. in that it connects us all. Mm -hmm. And the power of our storytelling is really getting at the molecular structure, human mole molecular structure of our connectivity. Mm -hmm. Grace is something we can all afford mm -hmm. and it connects us. Mm -hmm. I will say in closing, you know, in 2018, MBT supported some brilliant artists in Sweden to open the National Black Theater of Sweden. Jonathan and I had the privilege to go over and work with these Afro-Swedish artists. And we were wrestling with storytelling and there was a perception that there weren't any great Afro-Swedish authors. And it was because they were living inside a culture that valued storytelling in a very, uh, uh, the label in a very specific way. And Jonathan and I uplifted that everybody has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And that if you could tell your story radically, if you could tell your story authentically and apologetically, you are a writer. And that was confusing at first as a concept in this circle that we had created, story circle that we created. And we said, let's all write about a time that brings everyone together, right? Mm -hmm. So we said, what is Sweden's, you know, Martin Luther King's civil rights moment. And like, mm -hmm. can we reflect on that for, you know, your country and your culture? And they said, we don't have one. Our Martin Luther King Jr. moment, I have a dream moment was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That your protests opened the door for our protests. Right. Your words mm. and your strategy gave us words and yes. strategy. And so I end this incredible talk to say that the world is watching. Yeah. That we all have a responsibility Ashe. to our mother, which yes. is Ashe. Earth. Yes. And nature Ashe. will inform the way and it will always be what we strive to be, which yes. is authentic, unapologetic, yes. unflinching in its honesty and truth. And as a result, we will shift, we will grow, and we will move in the direction that we are supposed to move because the picture is always being painted and we just have to listen. Yes. I'm so grateful to the Mars Siegel Center for this award. I'm so yeah. grateful yeah. to the artists on this talk yeah. to be able to share some of us with you, a global audience, yes. and to say, ask the questions that are not being asked. And I invite you to have the conversations that are not being um, spoken about and to lean into the discomfort to be able to illuminate yes. the diamonds within all of us. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me, Keith and Jonathan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having us, Mark Siegel Center. And thank you for this award. Really and truly, it's an honor. All right.
done. I think, uh, you've heard his arm. I think you have to go through that.